In 1964, a radiant sun lit up the stage of the Great Hall of the People in Beijing. It was the 15th birthday of the People's Republic of China. A musical extravaganza, The East is Red, celebrated the history of the revolution that had created the communist state. The East is Red showed young kids like us why there had been a revolution. The Chinese people had experienced such incredible suffering. The Communist Party was founded under these historical conditions to save the Chinese people. In The East is Red, Mao Zedong forms a trinity with Marx and Lenin, prophets of a world revolution that would lead to a utopian, classless society. In 1964, China's leaders were divided over how to achieve that goal. The future would depend on how the past was defined. In this staged history, all other leaders were eclipsed. Mao alone leads the people to victory. We were taught at a young age that the true purpose of life was not to seek happiness for yourself. That was embarrassingly vulgar. A glorious and fulfilling life could only be achieved by dedicating yourself to a great revolutionary cause. For that cause, you must be willing to sacrifice your life. I'd sung this song myself at school concerts. Tears would well up in my eyes. My father had been executed by the nationalists. My mother had been imprisoned, and I was in jail with her. Chairman Mao's statement that countless revolutionary martyrs had sacrificed their lives for the people wasn't propaganda. For me, it was true. The East is Red presented a creation myth, an historical vision, a belief system, and a moral landscape, one in which a new generation now came of age. I long to be a professional revolutionary. No normal job, no family. I would simply spend all my time rushing around for the revolution. It would be the most thrilling and colorful life imaginable. Looking back on it today, this feeling was actually part of a universal and timeless adolescent impulse. If I'd been immersed in religious teachings instead, maybe I would have become one of the faithful. The motherland, the party, and the revolution came first. And yourself? You were nothing unless you were part of the great cause. To be excluded was to be left without a purpose in life. That was very, very painful. The East is Red was the biggest event I'd ever taken part in. I was about 10 years old. 20 kids from our school's choral group sang in it. One day, when I was about to leave for the performance, my father came in beaming. He was the president of China then. He told me, there will be some great news. Liu Ting's father, Liu Xiaoqi, had been Mao's closest comrade for decades. On October 16th, he came with Mao and Premier Zhou Enlai to meet with the cast of The East is Red. Zhou Enlai announced, China has exploded our first atom bomb. We jumped up and down. It felt like the stage might collapse. The imperialists could bully China because they had advanced technology and we were so poor. But now, sorry, we have the atom bomb. We can build our country in peace. You attack us, we'll get you back with the bomb. Now I think no one should have nuclear weapons. But back then, I was ecstatic, like I had the A-bomb in my own backyard. China, it was claimed, had another weapon, 
one that no other nation could possess. Bin Biao, head of the armed forces, called it a spiritual atom bomb, one more powerful than the actual atom bomb and far more potent. It was Mao Zedong thought. Only we can deploy this spiritual atom bomb, Lin said. We have a monopoly on it, and the imperialists can't compete with us. The climax of the East is Red was the founding of the People's Republic of China in 1949, a victory for world revolution. The young people who watched the celebration in 1964 would soon take the stage themselves. They would do battle for the future of that revolution. What began as a campaign to transform China's intellectual and artistic culture would sweep the nation into a frenzy of destruction. Millions would suffer. Untold numbers would die. To this day, the Cultural Revolution remains passionately debated, yet little understood. There are complex stories behind the pictures. Stories about how a revolution was made, and how revolution itself would be undone. The struggles of the Cultural Revolution were foreshadowed in long-standing differences among China's leaders. In 1958, Mao Zedong and the party leadership had set the country a bold new objective. A socialist economy had been established. China could now make a great leap forward into communism. Vastly expanded collective farms, people's communes, would cause production to skyrocket. A million home furnaces would soon make as much iron as the modern steelworks of Britain and America. Mao and his comrades wanted to believe the impossible was coming true. Instead, there were shortages of almost everything. Li Ray was one of Mao's secretaries, whose candor Mao had valued in the past. I said to him, you've been a farmer. How can you believe those impossible figures? I wrote Mao three letters. I said, this can't go on. At a central committee meeting, he praised my ideas to the skies. That was the high point of my career. After the meeting, lots of people said, aren't you the big fan? In the summer of 1959, Mao called a meeting to address the excesses of the Great Leap. But when senior leaders like Peng Dehuai confronted him about the policy's failures, Mao felt personally threatened. He declared that the party was under attack from a well-organized clique. Peng Dehuai's support quickly dissipated. He was denounced and deposed. Mao's secretary, Li Rei, was also purged as a member of Peng's anti-party clique. One day, when I was nine, my classmate said, don't play with her, her father is a big rightist. I burst into tears. When I got home, I noticed the service staff was gone. My mother told me that my father had made mistakes. Later, he was sent to the great northern wilderness. With the ouster of the opposition, the great leap forward went unchecked. There was widespread famine, and tens of millions died. It was no longer possible for party leaders to ignore the scale of the disaster. In the spring of 1961, the head of state, Liu Shaoqi, and his wife, Wang Guangmei, visited his home province of Hunan. They found it devastated. Things were worse than we had imagined. People were very unhappy, but they didn't dare speak up. Shao Qi urged them to tell the truth. He said, the top leaders must take responsibility. I apologize for your suffering. 
In the spring of 1962, at a special meeting of 7,000 key party leaders, Liu Xiaoqi declared that the government's policies had led to disaster. Mao conceded partial responsibility and left the day-to-day -day management of the country in the hands of Liu Xiaoqi and other economic moderates. Mao was soon displeased with how far some of his colleagues were willing to go, encouraging family farming and local markets. Never forget class struggle, he declared. Liu Xiaoqi, wary that economic recovery might be derailed, persuaded Mao to circulate his warning among party leaders only. Although the Great Leap had been halted, those who had predicted its failure were not forgiven. Li Rei, who had witnessed many deaths while exiled, could return home, but he was not exonerated. I was divorced, but I could still see my children. I wrote in a school essay, our party is great. In three years of severe natural disasters, no one starved to death. My father said, how do you know no one died? I thought he was such a reactionary. Everyone knew nobody had starved to death. But he had the nerve to say, how do you know? Back then, you couldn't talk about such things. I knew how the party worked. Once Mao had set the tone, no one could contradict him. By 1964, Liu Xiaoqi's policies had begun to revive the economy. The National Day Parade celebrated the new material prosperity, even though banners still hailed the triumphs of the Great Leap Forward. Mao, however, was increasingly concerned about the leaders who were willing to put prosperity before politics. Mao feared China would go the way of its old mentor, the Soviet Union, which he had last visited in 1957. He claimed Khrushchev's communism was a sham. Its economy encouraged private farm production. The Soviet education system was turning out a new class of technocrats lording over the masses. Mao saw the world's first socialist state undergoing a peaceful evolution toward capitalism. For Mao, the lesson was clear. Newly entrenched bureaucrats and educated elites were corrupting the revolution. To safeguard the political revolution, there must be a revolution in education and the arts, in the hearts and minds of all. There must be a cultural revolution. By 1964, the expression was frequently used in the press. Hailed as a great achievement in this revolution in culture, the East is Red represented new proletarian art. The performance concludes as the conductor leads the audience in singing the Internationale, the anthem of world socialism that the people of China would now sing alone. Chairman Mao said, you young people are like the morning sun. Our hope is placed on you. We felt that we were responsible for the whole world. Our generation had the duty to advance both the Chinese revolution and world revolution. The zeal for revolutionary ideals was accompanied by an underlying fear. It was an age ruled by both the poet and the executioner. The poet scattered roses everywhere, while the executioner cast a long shadow of terror. They were entwined, creating the environment in which we learned the culture of revolution during the 1950s and 60s. In the 1950s, after the communist victory, school children imbibed the culture of revolution. But they were also exposed to the art and literature of the past and of the outside world. The Central Philharmonic Symphony's Orchestra presents Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. 
Ballet, introduced into China only since liberation, has developed rapidly. By 1964, such performances were being criticized as the wrong kind of culture still holding sway over the stage in China. What was feudal, bourgeois, and revisionist had to be repudiated. The arts should celebrate the heroes of the new society, the workers, the peasants, the soldiers. Around 1964 and 65, a so-called revolutionizing movement took place in schools. It did two things. On the one hand, the revolutionary content in our education was greatly emphasized. On the other hand, the more moderate, universal, and humanistic values were negated. We were cut off from them. In school libraries, as well as bookstores, Western classics from Shakespeare to Tolstoy had been readily available. Young people eagerly read Victor Hugo, Romain Rolland, John Steinbeck, and Jack London. But the most popular Western book was an 1897 English novel called The Gadfly. The novel had a huge impact in revolutionary Russia, a film version of it, scored by Shostakovich, was dubbed into Chinese in the 1950s. The gadfly never ceased to appeal to the young people of China, though through the turbulent years to come, its meaning would change. Set in Italy, it's the tale of innocent, idealistic Arthur, a student in a Catholic seminary. His beloved mentor is a prominent priest who lavishes affection on the young man. Arthur is in love with Gemma. The two young people are inducted into a secret organization of revolutionaries. I read the book many times. It's a mix of revolutionary idealism and romantic love, a tragic tale. The gadfly represented all of our ideals. The revolutionary language moved me, but deep down it was its religious aura. The book had a huge influence in shaping our revolutionary faith. Arthur, under the seal of confession, reveals he belongs to the secret group. But the priest notifies the authorities, and the revolutionaries are arrested. Betrayed by the church, Arthur learns another terrible truth. His beloved mentor is actually his father. <laughs> Leaving behind a fake suicide note, Arthur will flee Italy and roam the world. When he returns years later, he will be a changed man. He will be the gadfly, the crippled, scarred, Byronic mocker, the revolutionary outlaw, a passionate heart beneath his ironic exterior. Having rejected the church, he has confirmed his faith in revolution. We were deeply moved. He had an indomitable revolutionary spirit. But there was more. We were fascinated by the gadfly's romantic, legendary life, something not found in works created under the Communist Party. Even the gadfly was too complex and ambivalent a figure for the new times. China needed simpler, purer heroes, ready to respond unquestioningly to the party's call. The model fighter in this war of civility was the People's Liberation Army soldier Lei Feng. After his accidental death in 1962, tales of his humble good deeds were turned into a legend featured in countless images, songs, and in a feature film. 
The inspiration for his everyday heroism came from being a diligent student of Mao Zedong thought. The selected works of Mao were being distributed throughout the armed forces on orders from Lin Biao, the Minister of Defense. Before the 10th grade, we were allowed to read all kinds of Western books. But later on, all those books were denounced. In essence, the campaign to learn from Lei Feng was read Chairman Mao's books, obey Chairman Mao's words, be Chairman Mao's good soldier. It meant you had to be loyal to an individual, not your revolutionary ideals. This contradicted the spirit of the Western books I'd read. Although the Gadfly and Jean Christophe were the kinds of books that really meant something to us, the pressure to conform was overwhelming. So-called thought reform is a process that gradually takes away your ability to think independently. Your own true thoughts and feelings have to be constantly repudiated. For example, Adventure in the Bandit's Den is a movie about a People's Liberation Army undercover agent. My favorite scene was Alan dancing the rumba. I thought the way she moved was very beautiful. But the message of the film was that she was shameless and depraved. But all she did was dance the rumba. Nowadays, aren't rumba dancers everywhere? <laughs> Besides, the actress was pretty. She had a great figure. For a bunch of boys at an all-boys school, her appeal was obvious. At the time, I would criticize myself. I wondered deep down if I was some kind of pervert. I believed my thoughts were dirty. Now with scientific knowledge, I see that I was sexually repressed. Become a bolt, a part of a machine? If you had any brains at all, why would you want to be a bolt? Compare Lei Feng to Mao. When Mao was young, he had his own ideas. He challenged society. Mao was creative and led a remarkable life. But we were supposed to be passive and obedient, like Lei Feng. I really regretted having missed out on the revolutionary era of blood and fire. Now all we could be were bolts. It was possible to unlearn selfish bourgeois thinking. It was possible to learn to be a shiny bolt in the socialist machine. But it was not possible to be born again or to unlearn a family background. Both my father and my mother had been capitalists. Around 1964-65, the issue of class became increasingly emphasized. The press constantly said that people from bourgeois families must reform themselves. If a person did something wrong, their family background would be pointed out. Naturally, this made you think that anyone with a bad background was born guilty, in a state of original sin. In our political education courses, we watch films and discuss them. For example, there was a film called Never Forget. The film's title, Never Forget, was taken from Mao's earlier warning to the party leadership, Never Forget Class Struggle. Now it was heard everywhere. The male lead, though the son of a worker, neglects his responsibility in the pursuit of material comfort. Then, of course, the root cause of his problem had to be dug up. As usual, it was the influence of someone from a bad family. 
To be from a bad family meant that your parents were on the wrong side of history. They had been dispossessed by the revolution and were still seen as potential enemies of the new society. The mother-in-law had been a shopkeeper in the past. Heedless of the new trend for revolutionary selflessness, she encourages the young couple to make money on the side. Ba 这是一种不容易看得清楚的阶级斗争。My older brother, Yulok Ke, was one of the best students in his school, but he couldn't get into college. He was very unfair, and the reason, of course, was his family background. Some people felt things were unfair. But they had always been unfair, in different ways, at different times. In the old society, they'd had the advantage of higher education for generations. But poor people had no education, so they could never catch up. The competition was unfair to begin with. Some people felt the admissions policy was too biased. But I thought it wasn't biased enough. The children of senior party officials had the best family background unless their parents had fallen from grace. Li Rei, Mao Zedong's one-time secretary who had been labeled as an enemy during the Great Leap Forward, was again banished in 1963 to a remote rural area. A classmate from an army family wrote in an essay, one of us has a father who was an enemy of the party, but she talks politics non-stop, tricking us into trusting her. Shouldn't we examine her from the perspective of class struggle? Her essay was read as a model composition in front of the whole school. People would point at me and whisper, she's the one, that essay is about her. I was thoroughly humiliated. I even wished that my father didn't exist, that he died a martyr long ago. He was a burden I had to bear forever. While we were taught about enemies when we were younger, those enemies existed in the past. They were in the movies and in novels. They weren't among us. But by 1964 and 65, you got the feeling that enemies were right next to you. Enemies within the party, Mao was convinced, were the most dangerous. They could be uncovered in the most theatrical fashion. In November 1965, an obscure historical opera was attacked in the press as a political allegory about Mao's suppression of critics of the Great Leap Forward. Within the party, the mayor of Beijing defended the work and its author. But the drumbeat of criticism continued in the press. Soon, the media was calling on the people to take an active part in the great socialist cultural revolution. The term cultural revolution had moved from the arts page to the front page. In May 1966, the official who wrote the opera and the entire city government of Beijing were publicly denounced for pursuing an anti-party, anti-socialist black line. They were the first high-profile casualties of the cultural revolution. It was profoundly shocking to students that such leaders would be plotting against Mao and socialism. Many had been dissatisfied with the education system for some time. Now they would connect their problems at school with the anti-party conspiracy being uncovered in the media. Mao, they felt, understood them and was on their side. His unpublished remarks about education had been circulating among them. He said, why shouldn't students doze off when lectures are boring? Unscheduled exams are like surprise attacks. Students are treated like enemies. Bourgeois intellectuals must no longer control our schools. 
We wanted the cultural revolution to come to the schools. We were inspired by the new radical thinking that was coming out of the army. Mao Zedong's thought was emphasized over everything else. I put up an essay on the class bulletin board, criticizing the school. Initially, we were trying to be constructive, but the school leaders reacted to criticism the way that the Communist Party always did, with repression. We were accused not of pushing extreme revolutionary ideas, but rather of challenging the Communist Party. That is, we were being anti-party, and that was a terrible crime back then. People followed us, eavesdropping on our conversations and taking notes. When we wanted to talk, we'd go to the ruins of the old imperial gardens near our school. It was deserted and quiet there. By the end of May, we agreed that everyone who was critical of the school should sign their essays with one name, speak with one voice. We chose the name Red Guard. There were about 20 of us. Meanwhile, at Peking University, a group put up a handwritten poster denouncing the school's leaders for sabotaging the Cultural Revolution. Such big character posters were the only way for people outside the official media to reach a broader audience. Rather than being suppressed, the poster was published on Mao's orders. It appeared in the media with an inflammatory essay that attacked the university as an important base for the black gang of deposed Beijing officials. Before this, we were under great pressure and had decided to keep a low profile. After hearing the broadcast, we realized what was going on. On June 2nd, we wrote a manifesto and signed it, The Red Guards. It was the first time this name appeared on a big character poster. The publication of the Peking University poster created confusion and uproar on campuses across the country. In the following days, the small group of Red Guards put up more posters, accusing their high school of imposing bourgeois revisionist educational policies. Some of their fellow students ridiculed the Red Guards. Others saw in them an ominous threat and called them Black Guards. Hidden enemies were constantly being exposed in the press. They were called demons, monsters, members of black gangs. Young students excited about their chance to make revolution were primed by the media to uncover enemies themselves. I disliked my teacher. He was also very ugly. Our heads were full of stereotypes, and I thought that he looked just like a spy. Movies gave us the impression that anyone could be a spy. Every evening, we'd hide behind the bushes near the teacher's dormitory to watch his every move. Would he be sending radio signals? Or carrying out some reactionary activities to sabotage the Cultural Revolution? Since the Nationalist government had been defeated not too long ago, we imagined that its agents were still everywhere. It was only natural for us to suspect our teacher of being a spy. Soon, most schools were paralyzed. The Central Committee of the party sent out hastily organized work teams to direct the emerging revolution. The work team said, the school's leaders are under investigation. The Red Guards are, in fact, reliable leftists. The students and teachers who had opposed us now supported us. But once the work team replaced the school's leaders, it said that a Red Guard organization was not appropriate. The party never tolerated spontaneous organizations, but we didn't want to simply disband. Ever since I was a child, I'd been fascinated by the story of the Monkey King. I loved his defiant attitude towards pompous authority figures. The Monkey King's wreaking havoc in heaven was the quintessential act of rebellion. Mao once said, if the central leadership of the party went revisionist, he would call on Monkey Kings from the grassroots to wreak havoc in heaven. So I wrote an essay called Long Live the Spirit of Revolutionary Rebellion. It included lines about the Monkey King. The point was, we should dare to oppose anyone who violated Mao Zedong thought. The others liked it, so it was signed Red Guards. The work team was alarmed. They said, advocating rebellion under socialism is reactionary. 
So I wrote a second essay responding to the charges against us. The combative language we used was influenced by the rhetoric of the new leftists, but it also included our own innovations. We revolutionaries are monkey kings, they declared. We will turn the old world upside down, smash it to pieces, create chaos and make a huge mess. The messier the better. <laughs> July 16th marked the 11th annual swim across the Yangtze River in honor of a historic swim Mao made in 1956. This year, completely unannounced, Mao appeared at the event. The chaos he had caused had been left to be sorted out by Liu Shaoqi, the head of state. The work teams had to conduct a purge while trying to maintain order and prevent abuses. As was common party practice, Work teams were calling anyone who questioned their authority a counter-revolutionary, generating further frustration and anger among students. Nine days after his swim, Mao's heroic feat was suddenly reported with great fanfare in the national media. The picture in the newspaper was so grand. There was old Mao waving his hand. He may as well have been standing on the water. It was the style of a revolutionary leader unparalleled in all history. Our school quickly organized swimming classes. Everyone had to become good enough to swim across the river. The media spoke of a new tempest, a dramatic fight against the forces of reaction. Everyone should be ready to follow Chairman Mao through the wind and waves. Mao returned to Beijing, and he brought the storm with him. He ordered the work teams to withdraw, and he told party leaders, anyone who represses a student movement will come to no good end. Mao's wife, Jiang Qing, had championed the revolution in the performing arts since the early 1960s, but was rarely seen in public. Now she stepped onto the political stage to play a high-profile role. In late July 1966, she addressed crowds of students as a member of Mao's hand-picked Cultural Revolution leading group. A Red Guard handed Jiang Qing our essays about rebellion. He also wrote a note. It said, some people say our essays are reactionary. Please give them to Chairman Mao. We'd like to know what he thinks. Mao immediately composed a response to the Red Guards, affirming their right to rebel. Although this response was only circulated among party leaders, people soon learned of his stance. Students throughout the city rushed to call themselves Red Guards. New groups proliferated, each with their own self-styled agenda. Many children of old revolutionaries donned their parents' faded military uniforms and put on armbands in imitation of early images of the Red Army. They declared that they were born red. They were the natural heirs of the original revolution, the natural leaders of this new rebellion. They made up a saying that summed up their sentiments. Father a revolutionary, son a hero. Father a reactionary, son a bastard. So they argued, Students from bad family backgrounds had no right to call themselves Red Guards. They were sons of bitches. Some were even beaten up. On August 1st, a major party conference began, behind closed doors as usual. Mao took the chair. Changes in leadership and party thinking were impending. On August 5th, Mao circulated a note entitled, Bombard the Headquarters which could only mean that top party leaders were the object of his wrath. Once again, Mao praised the big character poster put up at Peking University and claimed that this note was his own big character poster, as though he too were a rebel outsider trying to be heard. Just as party leaders were puzzling over Mao's note, students now freed from the control of the work teams competed to demonstrate their revolutionary zeal. They lashed out at teachers and school administrators. 
Some students made school administrators do hard labor on campus. As they worked, the students beat and insulted them. It was a hot and muggy August day. Bian Zhongyun, the vice principal, collapsed under this treatment. She had high blood pressure and heart trouble. I wasn't at school at the time, but I heard about the beatings later. The next morning, we were all sitting in our classrooms when the PA system came on. The message that day was very curt. Bian Zhongyun's dead. There's no need to talk about it anymore. Everyone froze in their seats. For a long time, the room was so quiet that you could hear a pin drop. The way I felt, well, I was scared stiff. A couple of months ago, she was an authority figure. And now she was simply beaten to death. We heard about many cases of violence. We were very concerned and decided to alert the central leaders. On August 6, I wrote a document called An Urgent Appeal, condemning the violence. But it met with instant opposition. Some Red Guard leaders said it put a damper on the mass movement. Later on, we heard that Mao also opposed our appeal. If the Cultural Revolution was about this kind of violence, I couldn't be a revolutionary. My school, Teachers College Girls High, was the best girls' school in Beijing or even the whole country. How could students from such a school go from being nice girls to being murderers? Back at the party conference, Mao railed against top leaders for using work teams to suppress the masses. His second-in-command, Liu Shaoqi, was quick to blame himself for failing to keep pace with Mao's thinking. Newly favored was Mao's unflagging devotee, Lin Biao, head of the army, the tireless promoter of the chairman's universal wisdom. None of this maneuvering was public. On August 9th, the People's Daily printed a red banner headline, Decision by the Central Committee of the Communist Party of China on the Great Proletarian Cultural Revolution. It heralded a new stage in the advancement of socialism and gave unprecedented prominence to the role of young people. In the past, grown-ups never took us seriously, but now they paid attention whenever we opened our mouths. At the time, we felt that revolution was a grand festival, just like Lenin said. In the middle of the night, on August 17th, we were suddenly notified that a rally would be held the next morning at Tiananmen Square. We weren't told who would be there, but we all thought that Mao might appear. In the early hours of August 18, 1966, before the rally officially began, Mao suddenly walked into Tiananmen Square. It was unheard of. State and party leaders regularly appeared, but on the rostrum overlooking the square to review major parades or address mass rallies. But Mao was here, as the first light of day was coming from the east. A primary school classmate of mine shook hands with Mao. She didn't wash her hands for days. Everyone wanted to shake her hand because she had shaken Mao's hand. I often wondered, if I'd had such an exhilarating experience, would I have been more passionate about the Cultural Revolution? Can something like that change the way a person feels and acts? I don't know. When we saw the light of dawn, we felt as if this was the dawn of a new era for mankind. We felt that we were about to embark on an unprecedented revolution. It would bring about a society that was truly egalitarian and democratic, one without private property or selfish thoughts. 
a brand new society. The Little Red Book, a distillation of Mao's writings, had been circulating in the army since 1964. Now there was a copy in every hand. Chairman Mao came over to one end of the rostrum and waved to us. He was wearing a People's Liberation Army uniform. This made us even more excited. A great revolution was really about to begin. Chairman Mao was already dressed for it. We were suddenly told that the Red Guard should send delegates up to the rostrum. We were ecstatic. We shook hands with Mao and said, we wish Chairman Mao a long life without end. And he said, even a long life comes to an end. Standing next to Mao was Lin Biao, the chairman's new second in command. Way down the line stood the former number two leader, Liu Shaoqi. Lin Biao's speech praised the new red soldiers and fueled their rebellion. The events of the day were made into a propaganda film and narrated by a red guard. The young people who had been imbued with a sense of history from the East as Red were now on the stage themselves. The Red Guards were all excited. They went around putting armbands on party leaders. Someone said, Bin Bin, why not give one to Chairman Mao? So I went up to him. I was very naive and took it to be a casual remark. But an article soon appeared in the newspaper with the title, I put a red armband on Chairman Mao. It was written in the first person and signed Song Bi Militant, with my name Song Bin Bin in brackets. I couldn't believe the press would fabricate a new name for me and put words in my mouth for their propaganda needs. My name didn't belong to me anymore. I had to change it. So my friends helped me find a new, single-syllable name by randomly picking a word out of a dictionary. Lin Biao's speech at the rally was broadcast across the country. Old ideas, old culture, old customs, old habits. They would come to be called simply the four olds. Yeah.
There was a famous hair salon. It displayed photographs of all kinds of hairdos. When the Cultural Revolution came, they were seen as examples of bourgeois decadence. A group of Red Guards took over the place. We said to them, when the revolution starts to dictate the style of people's hair, clothes and shoes, isn't the revolution being trivialized? Temples and shrines were ransacked. Despite official designation as cultural treasures, many irreplaceable objects were destroyed. We were told to assemble at the Central Art Academy. Old sculptures from the Tang, Sung and Ming dynasties were piled in a heap. Also statues of David and the like, the kind used in drawing classes. The rebels were full of themselves. They struck poses as they smashed everything. They lit the pile and made us stand around it. It was one of the hottest days of the summer. The flames rose a hundred feet. They ordered us to get down on our knees. They sang and they kicked us, forcing us closer to the flames. What did it look like? Cannibals in a song and dance ritual, about to cook their captives. Were there any rules for wiping out the four olds? No, the kids made them up. So a lot of things went wrong. I was against much of that. But there were also things that, though I think they're wrong now, appealed to me back then. I have to be honest. For example, Christianity. At the time, I thought what happened was great. Why? Because the imperialists had bullied China in two ways. One was with guns, like in the Opium War. The other had to do with spiritual opium. The priests and nuns never did anything good. They were part and parcel of cultural imperialism. The Red Guard searched the homes of officials of the pre-revolutionary government, former landlords who now lived in the city, former capitalists who had long since given up their assets. The local police asked the Minister of Public Security if the Red Guard should be stopped. No, that would be unwise. Give them the names of known reactionaries and keep out of their way. Those rounded up were made to write self-denunciations. They wore their names on their backs. Capitalist, landlord, criminal, pervert. Many were then driven out of Beijing in the name of purifying the revolutionary capital. We knew our home would be a target sooner or later. We fit the category. My parents had both been capitalists. Finally, one day, the Red Guards came charging in and turned our house upside down. It was terrifying. They forced my parents to kneel and beat them. The searches uncovered all kinds of things. House and land deeds, gold and silver, and old official appointment certificates. They were even hidden in the walls. There was a fellow who'd been a brigadier general in the Nationalist Army. They'd found his uniform and some weapons. I didn't take part in the beating, but I watched. I really wanted to beat him because I felt such hatred. The past was still too close. As the son of a martyr, I remember all too well how we suffered in prison. The Nationalists buried my father alive. Many of my friends also had painful memories of their family's sufferings and persecution. And now we'd come across someone like this. So what if he was beaten up? At the time, we felt he deserved it. It was only just. It was impossible for us to calmly consider the legalities and his human rights. I believe that if such people got back into power, they'd chop off my head. Those kids who were the most revolutionary chanted Mao's quotation. A revolution is not a dinner party or writing an essay, or painting a picture, or doing embroidery. A revolution is an insurrection, an act of violence by which one class overthrows another. 
Mao Zedong's great orders to these foreigners. So this great directive of Chairman Mao legitimized all those acts of brutality. The quotation came from a 1927 report Mao prepared for the Communist Party about violent peasant uprisings in Hunan Province. It was contained in the Little Red Book. These methods weren't invented during the Cultural Revolution. We'd seen a lot of this in revolutionary films as we were growing up. Mao said in his Hunan report, the peasants are angry. Put dunce caps on the landlords. Drag them through the streets. Mao then went further, saying, whether you think such brutality is good or bad is the test of a true revolutionary. Mao argued that the peasant violence was an inevitable response to landlord oppression. To redress past wrongs, it was necessary to go to extremes. Even some of our revolutionary comrades say it's terrible, Mao declared, but in fact, it's excellent. The People's Daily used the expression, it's excellent, as the headline for an editorial praising the Red Guards, and everybody understood it as a reference to Mao's 1927 report. Even though the editorial neither mentioned the report nor praised violence, it was clear that the extreme actions of the Red Guards were not to be criticized. The other kids started beating her up. We were in a very small room. Should I also beat her? I was 15 years old, and I thought I was being tested. I felt that I had to charge forth. I didn't want to be a cowardly deserter. I could have chosen not to join in, but that required a greater courage, the strength of conscience. Later I thought, what if I didn't join in? My Red Guard comrades would have thought I was a traitor. But so what if they thought that? I made the wrong choice, and I have to take responsibility for it. Yang Rei was not the only young person who overcame an initial reluctance to use violence. The pressure to do so was intense. I had a good friend who came from a worker's family. She told me that at first she couldn't bring herself to beat people. But to be accepted by the other Red Guards, she felt that she'd have to be as revolutionary as they were. She said, so I followed their example and started beating people. People were reading the posters denouncing me. I was sweeping the floor. Two young men saw me. They took off their leather belts and started beating me. When they got tired, they ordered me to kneel. I did. They beat me some more. Then they took a break and ordered me to take off my jacket. I folded it nice and neat and waited for them to start up again. She told me that once she started beating people, she became addicted to it. She said, I got quite a high from it. The people you beat up didn't dare fight back. You felt so heroic. I can't remember her exact words, but it was something like, you felt so incredibly strong. People were afraid of you. You had this awe-inspiring prowess. Normally, would I have let anyone lift a finger against me? I'd never lost a fight in my life. In those circumstances, if I'd fought back, my whole family would have been destroyed. So I decided to show them that a man taking a beating could have dignity and prowess. I didn't let out a sound as they hit me. I used martial arts techniques to control my breathing. I counted the blows. They hit me 224 times. My shirt was soaked through with blood. It stuck to my back. She told me, you know how bad it got? I wouldn't stop beating someone until my arms hurt. I thought, this is really scary, because she was actually very nice, and we had been friends for a long time. She wasn't a bad person, yet she could do something like this. 
After the Cultural Revolution, some young friends of mine found the guys who'd beaten me. Should we teach them a lesson? I said, let them go. They'd behave that way at the start of the Cultural Revolution. Later, their families must have been victimized too. No one could have escaped the Cultural Revolution. Their own family's sufferings were retribution enough. That's the way it was. I didn't take part in smashing the four olds or the house searches, but rumors were everywhere. Song be militant. The one who put the Red Guard armband on Mao was brutally beating people up. I was very upset because I had always been against violence. Red Guards from other schools would come to check me out. You're the one? You're not what we expected. I didn't fit their idea of a revolutionary. My name and my image were hijacked. I'd lost control over my identity. I was furious. But I was also sad that people suffered because of what that name stood for. When I first joined the Cultural Revolution, I thought we were going to repudiate bourgeois policies and education. But it turned into something altogether different. In August, Beijing was a city of horror. The streets were deserted in the afternoon. If you saw a small gathering of people, you knew that someone had been beaten to death. We went around trying to stop the violence. In one household, the mother had been killed. Her son showed us her body. We found out which Red Guards did it. We went to their school and told them they had to stop. But at the same time, people were also being beaten up in our own high school. Leaders of mass organizations couldn't control their members. All we could do was appeal to the Cultural Revolution leading group to intervene. But no one listened to us. The violence spread out of control like a plague. Mao's first review of the Red Guards led to a series of mass rallies in Tiananmen. Young people from around the country flocked to the square to see and be seen by the chairman. In the movies, people waved little red books and wept. Now it was happening all around me. But to my surprise, I didn't feel all that excited. And yet, since everyone else was jumping up and down and shouting, I acted the same way. Maybe the atmosphere was contagious. Today, high school kids get hysterical over rock stars, yelling and jumping, even fainting. We laugh at these kids. What is there to worship in those rock stars? They're so shallow. But these kids can laugh at what we did. What was there to worship in Mao? An old guy in an army suit who had nothing to do with you? He couldn't even sing or dance. From Beijing, those who had seen the chairman went out to link up with other groups, to spread the new word of rebellion from school to school, town to town. Young people were even given free passes on trains and buses. For most, it was their first experience of freedom, freedom from parents, from school, freedom to come and go and meet other young people. They were the successors to the revolution. They were the masters of a new China, and they wanted to see their inheritance. One group from the city of Dalian decided to march to Beijing on foot. They were praised in the People's Daily, the headline taken from one of Mao's poems. The Red Army fears not the difficulties of a long march. It was changed to read, the Red Guards fear not the difficulties of a long march. The long march, when the communist forces trekked over 8,000 miles to the north in the mid-1930s, was the central event in Chinese revolutionary mythology. 
The long march became a metaphor for the revolution itself. I wanted to go on a march, but my mother said, no, you know nothing about the world outside Beijing. So I waited until she left for work and wrote her a note. I used the line by Mao and said that she was like a woman with bound feet waddling behind the revolution. Then I left. A few of us traveled to Mao's birthplace at Shaoshan, and then we went our separate ways. I headed for Zunyi. Zunyi was an important stop on the Long March. Here, Mao's military strategy was adopted by the party. This marked his ascendancy as undisputed leader and led to the ultimate success of the Long March. I thought this was one of the most heroic episodes in history. So I wanted to retrace the route myself, just like the Red Army. It was so romantic. On December 1st, I was alone in Zunyi with only one penny left. I bought a piece of candy and had a little celebration for myself. I just turned 16. Then I started my own long march, carrying a bunch of Mao's writings and wearing straw sandals. Every point along the way of the long march was a stop on a sacred pilgrimage. Past Sunyi was the Luding Bridge. A nationalist garrison had destroyed the wooden planks that covered it. Seventeen heroes took the bridgehead, some dying in the process. a symbol of revolutionary ideals made concrete by individual sacrifice and daring leadership. Like pilgrims, the young people walk to reproduce in themselves the revolutionary experience. They retrace China's revolutionary past in search of its even more truly revolutionary future. The Cultural Revolution was heating up at my film studio, but I wasn't interested. All I wanted to do was make films, so I thought I could go out and film the Red Guards on their link-ups. I heard that some Red Guards from the Inner Mongolia Teachers College were going on a march. I went to check them out. They looked great. Everyone wore army uniforms, the most fashionable style at the time. The group was going to march 350 miles south from their home to the terminus of the long march at Yan'an, then on to Beijing. I used a 16-millimeter movie camera, a Bolex, the kind you have to wind up. Where we were going, there was no electricity to charge batteries. Young people from the villages were thrilled to see us. They'd rush over and ask for leaflets and Mao's writings. These places were very remote. Visitors brought great excitement. We arrived at the Yellow River. Huge chunks of ice were coursing downstream. It was scary. How could we get across? We talked to local boatmen. They were willing to help. The boat edged forward amid ice flows. Everyone felt as if this was our moment, our great test. 
Little red book in hand, they chanted, Be resolute, fear no sacrifice, overcome all difficulties to win victory. And someone burst out with the Chairman Mao pole. The Red Army fears not the difficulties of a long march, and they all chanted together. When we reached the other side, we thanked the boatmen for helping us on our great journey. They said, give our greetings to Chairman Mao. The people here were so kind and sincere. They didn't have enough food, but they'd offer us a solid meal while they ate porridge. It was very touching. Once we stayed with an old woman, she wanted to give us a special treat, fried cabbage. She used only a single drop of oil. Usually she only did this for New Year's. We couldn't even taste the oil, but for her it was a very big deal. I started to wonder, how come so many years after the revolution, people are still so poor? There was a mountain near the town of Shenmu with temples on it. Look at all these Buddhist statues, the four olds. These were remnants of feudal superstition. So bang, 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 they went in and smashed everything. At the time, we were quite excited. We got some real revolutionary action shots. Looking back now, it was ridiculous. The group had marched 350 miles and come to the revolutionary city of Yan'an. An old Buddhist pagoda overlooked the city. The pagoda was a sacred symbol of the revolutionary holy land. Actually, it was just an old relic. But it was endowed with a new meaning because Mao had once lived in the area. In the 1930s and 40s, Yan'an had attracted young people from all over the country who wanted to fight for a strong and independent China. Later, it was always depicted as a place where revolutionary ideals were realized through camaraderie and hard work. Yan'an represented a golden age, an egalitarian, self-sufficient utopia. The young people of the 1960s imagined it as an idyllic world of proto-communism from which the revolution had strayed. We went to see the plot once farmed by Chairman Mao. Red guards were scraping up the dirt. They reverently wrapped it in paper and tucked it away. They were behaving like religious pilgrims. But I didn't dare say that. Such a comment could mark you as a counter-revolutionary. If someone told on you, you'd be denounced in a struggle meeting. What was not on exhibit for the new revolutionary tourists was the darker legacy of Yan'an. In the early 1940s, a rectification movement identified numerous enemy agents among loyal party members. The fear of infiltration led to intense denunciations. Li Ray, a young man attracted by the ideals of Yan'an experienced the terror firsthand. Under torture, people could say anything. I'm a spy. Well, a spy has to report to someone. Who are you working for? I was named. During my interrogation, they handcuffed me and made me stand until my legs swelled up. This was routine. Even worse were the tiger bench, beatings, being tied to a cross. Later, Mao realized that all the charges were groundless. He bowed and apologized to us. Yet the real problem of unrestricted power was never addressed. 
But back then, we were so dedicated to our communist ideals, we felt that mistakes were unavoidable. Li Ray's generation of revolutionaries forgave the party and stayed loyal to Mao. For them, the Yan'an years were a rite of passage. For Li Ray's daughter and her fellow students, 1966 saw the beginning of their journey of discovery. Walking through the countryside had an impact on my whole life. I saw China through different eyes. I realized how insignificant I was. In school, we had imagined transforming the whole world. It now seemed rather far-fetched. What I saw on my travels didn't match my idealized vision of China. People were just busy fighting each other. I was disheartened by this revolution. I realized that I knew nothing about the realities of China. I was ignorant of the very meaning of revolution. So I decided to drop out of the movement and do some serious reading. While students roamed the country in late 1966, the Cultural Revolution Leading Group directed their attacks on the so-called bourgeois reactionary line of the state president, Liu Shaoqi. He and his cohort, including leaders like Deng Xiaoping, were blamed for suppressing the masses and leading the Cultural Revolution astray. The correct aim of the movement, Mao had emphasized, was to unseat people inside the party taking the capitalist road Many of these capitalist roaders were the parents of the first Red Guards. Jiang Qing and her colleagues had nothing but praise for these Red Guards the previous summer. Now they were blamed. They were no longer revolutionary trailblazers. Instead, they had been serving Liu Shaoqi's policy when they had suppressed students who had bad family backgrounds. What Jiang Qing said then really appealed to the common people. For example, she criticized the saying, father a reactionary, son a bastard. She said, that's garbage. Her apparent outrage made us feel as though she was our savior. She actually spoke up for people like us. At the same time, Red Guard violence was halted. We were relieved. There were many excesses as the Red Guard movement grew. We were opposed to these things right from the start. We appealed to the Cultural Revolution leading group, but they thought we were just getting in the way. And now they blamed everything on us and took no responsibility themselves. I lost all respect for them, and I wrote essays criticizing Jiang Qing by name. Within a few short months, the Red Guards, who had been at the forefront of the Cultural Revolution, became its opponents. Now they were suppressed. They had assumed that the revolutionary enterprise was theirs alone. But the tide had turned, and they found themselves on the wrong side of history. Meanwhile, the students who had been excluded from the Red Guards formed their own organizations, they all claimed the name for themselves. Their grievances now had a legitimate target. It was Mao's enemies who had caused all their suffering in the past. And they all pledged to fight for Chairman Mao's revolutionary line. Higher and higher ranking officials were denounced at mass rallies as capitalist roaders. Soon, China was in a state of virtual anarchy. Rebel groups clamored to be heard. Manifestos, independent newsletters and papers proliferated. The Communist Party had always controlled the press. But now no one was in charge. Students did whatever they wanted. We started our own paper. We imitated Mao's calligraphy for the title, The Cultural Revolution in High Schools. We published the essay on family background. On family background was written by Yu Le Ke, Yulo Wen's older brother. In the essay, he declared that all young people should be treated equally. 
the discrimination based on the class status of your parents in China was little different from the caste system in India or racial discrimination in the United States. If young people read on family background today, they'd probably think, what's the big deal? What it says is obvious. But back then, if an essay so much as raised the issue of equality, it was a very big deal. Some people even told us, I used to feel life wasn't worth living, but after reading this article, I can go on. Equality meant the equal right to make revolution. What does the class status of your parents have to do with whether or not you are a revolutionary? Yu Lecoe's essay asked. The question of who should lead the revolution is not determined in the womb. To survive in that society, you had to be part of the revolution. There was no alternative. Only those who were allowed to follow Chairman Mao in making revolution had a future. Why did we fight for the right to make revolution and not some other right? Because there were no other rights. There was only one right, the right to make revolution. While some took the opportunity to protest against their own oppression, others followed what was hailed as Mao's grand strategic vision. They were intent on unmasking China's Khrushchev, the number one capitalist rotor in the party, the man who had opposed the Great Leap Forward, who advocated capitalist economic policies. This traitor to the revolution was none other than Liu Shaoqi. Liu's wife, Wang Guangmei, became the ritual scapegoat for her husband. She was taken to a mass rally at Tsinghua University, where she had advised the now discredited work team. It was a farce. It was unreal. In your wildest dreams, you couldn't imagine how they tried to demean me. They forced me to wear a fancy dress and a necklace made of ping pong balls. We were stunned. We felt like animals in a zoo. People said, those are Liu Xiaoqi's children, as if we were animals. She refused to kneel. The crowd screamed. The speakers demanded, why were Liu Xiaoqi's orders always followed and Chairman Mao's ignored? They accused my mother of suppressing the students on my father's orders. They denounced her background. They said she'd attended a missionary college and had weaseled her way into the Communist Party to influence my father. Government officials were dragged out to endless rounds of struggle meetings. They were often beaten and tortured in makeshift jails. Many died. Among their numerous crimes, they were accused of having been too lenient toward anti-party elements in the past. Casualties of earlier purges, like Li Ray, were brought back from exile and denounced as living proof of their crimes. The rebels were denouncing government ministers. They wanted me back to put me on display. So I got a chance to go home for a visit. I got home and saw my parents in the living room. I was shocked because I felt as though my father didn't exist anymore. He had faded away and should never return. He represented danger. All he'd ever brought us was harm. My father said, oh, you've grown so tall. I blurted out, Dad. Then I regretted saying it. What's wrong with me, I thought. I'm a Communist Youth League member. I thought I was so firm in my convictions. How could I call him Dad? All the feelings I had for my family, my children, had to be suppressed. For years, I'd had to bury them deep in my heart. At school the next day, I dutifully made a report. I said, my father came for a visit, and I called him dad. That was wrong. It shows that I have not fully reformed myself. I will try harder. Through the early months of 1967, the rebels hailed the nationwide revolutionary storm. The bizarre rhetoric, the violent language, and the moral outrage were not just for show. 
In a system that lacked any channels for airing grievances and resolving conflicts, the movement provided a rare opportunity for people to vent their anger. The people in power had always suppressed the masses while taking good care of themselves. So when Mao said to overthrow officials taking the capitalist road, all those in authority were dumped. The masses couldn't care less who was taking what road. Initially, at least, it was liberating. But without the rule of law, a mob mentality took over. This is no way to affect change. In the end, everybody gets hurt. You can say that the Cultural Revolution was the first time people had a chance to challenge the privilege of the party. Yet at the same time, human rights were reduced to nothing. No one had any legal protection. Anyone could be attacked for being reactionary or whatever. Rebels seized power, and while the old system was being smashed, its bureaucratic ways were replicated. Soon the rebels themselves were forming contending factions. Grandstanding and dramatic gestures marked the progress of factional fighting. Positions were occupied, defended and lost amidst the blare of loudspeakers and the feints of warfare. All swore to fight to the death in defense of Chairman Mao's revolutionary line. On June 5, 1967, the two factions in Harbin went from staging sit-ins to fighting each other. I climbed up a tree so I could take pictures of the whole scene. They all had clubs, and they fought over the public address vehicle. At the College of Civil Engineering, two groups fought over a building. The people upstairs threw everything they could find at their attackers. When they ran out of things to throw, they remembered the library. Get the killer books and take them upstairs. Of course, the killer books were the big, thick ones. If you were clambering up a ladder and a book came pelting down, you'd get a big lump on your head or you'd be knocked down. This wasn't the worst of the violence. Workers at a weapons factory drove tanks out into the streets. They blasted each other with the cannons. For some, it was pitched battle. Others were just fighting to survive. The factional chaos also offered abundant opportunities for the ambitious. In the summer months of 1967, the Cultural Revolution leading group encouraged students to demand that Liu Shaoqi appear before the masses. Students surrounded the party compound of Zhongnan High in central Beijing and demonstrated in a constant vigil. Although Leo and his wife were safe from those outside the walls, rebels inside, among the compound staff, grabbed them and held impromptu denunciations. You can say my father represents the tragedy of China. Once he took out the constitution and said, you're not allowed to beat people or to search their homes. Later, he referred to the constitution again. I'm still the president, and I still have the right to be heard. Wasn't it all a bit too late? How could the Cultural Revolution have reached such a point? The words of a single person, Chairman Mao, could override party policy, and party policy could override the law. And here was my father, a man who'd worked for the revolution for decades, and he came to a tragic end. I'm not saying he didn't make mistakes. He'd gone along with Chairman Mao and purged others. After 1949, the Communist Party had launched one denunciation movement after another. Chairman Mao said bad elements always make up 5% of the population, a very large number. Imagine trying to jail that many people. Mao once said, out of great disorder, great order is achieved. Mao believed that the threat to the revolution could only be removed by mobilizing the masses. As China was brought to the brink of disaster, however, the masses themselves were the threat. Now it was time for order, and Mao had the means to impose it. Mao had never lost control over the army. 
it would be the instrumental force behind a harsh new revolutionary order. Having smashed the old world, rebels of all persuasions would join the first Red Guards on the wrong side of history. The free-for-all atmosphere of the preceding months dissipated. Those who had used the relative anarchy to question the system were now systematically singled out. The Cultural Revolution leading group said, on family background is a poisonous weed. Our paper was closed down. My brother was put under surveillance. He was followed everywhere. Far more poisonous than Yulokeu's many essays were the entries in his personal diary. In May 1966, as the media whipped up popular zeal to weed out enemies of Mao Zedong thought, Yulokeu quoted Montesquieu's Persian letters. In order to love and conform to one's religion, it is not necessary to hate and persecute those who do not conform to it. The word religion, wrote Yulokeu, can simply be replaced by Marxism-Leninism or someone's thought. The diary fell into the hands of the authorities. On January 5, 1968, he went to work as usual but didn't return. We knew he'd been arrested. By the end of 1967, I was sick of the factional struggles at school. I didn't know what the revolution was about anymore. Just then, recruiters came to sign up workers to build a factory in a remote area. There, it would be safe from attack by the imperialists. I could be a worker, the kind that Chairman Mao wanted, a revolutionary worker, like the morning sun still rising. Although I was treated as a so-called bastard, I wrote in my diary every day. Follow Chairman Mao in revolution. I thought if I died for the revolution, my diary would convince people of my true revolutionary loyalty. For some time, small numbers of young people from the cities had been settling in the countryside. By really becoming one with the people, they hoped to put their ideals into practice. In late 1968, colleges were still closed and urban jobs scarce. A huge backlog of high school students had built up in the cities. Now these restive young people had somewhere to go. I went to the countryside voluntarily. At first, I felt a great sense of mission to help close the gap between the countryside and the city. Change should start with ourselves so that we could carry the Cultural Revolution through to the end. The imagery was upbeat, not only in the official media, but even in personal photographs. Other stories left no visual record. Rumors about me reached the village before I arrived. Song Bi Militant is coming to settle here, the one who burns, loots and rapes. The villagers were afraid, and they didn't want me there. But by working hard with them, I was able to gain their acceptance, and they came to treat me with great kindness. My father named me Bin Bin because he wanted a daughter who was gentle and refined, and I was indeed like that. If my name hadn't meant gentle, Ma wouldn't have said, better to be militant, and then there wouldn't have been all these rumors. The name Sung Be Militant is totally against my beliefs. It's sad how history could have played such a bad joke. We'd already had doubts about the Cultural Revolution. How come the political struggles under our great leader were so devious? Once we got to the countryside, we were in for a greater shock. The realities of China had nothing to do with what was in our books. The lives of the peasants were truly miserable. This experience led to a further liberation of our thinking. We began to confront the larger political myth, the so-called superiority of the socialist system. I often wondered why Mao sent us young people to the countryside, because he turned so many of us into heretics. 
Mao should have known that the peasants would tell us things. For example, around 1960, many people had starved to death. So we started to feel disillusioned. It was a very painful process. My thinking underwent a fundamental change. We read a lot of Western literature and we talked to each other. The countryside was a vast, free realm. In the city, if you listened to Voice of America, your neighbor would report you. But in the countryside, we were beyond anyone's control. As these young people were questioning their revolutionary faith, the personality cult of Chairman Mao grew ever more extravagant. The votive images were more numerous, the adulation more excessive. There was a Mao for all seasons, a thought for every clime. Mao's thought could answer all questions. It could even cure the incurable. Mao主席外岁，经过两个多月的精心治疗，全校一百零五名聋哑学生终于全部恢复了听力。Mao主席外岁，家乡。深受迫害的聋哑人再也按不住满腔的怒火，千仇万恨都要集中到刘少奇的
Of course, at first that was limited to anyone under Mao, or even under Lin Biao, but it was only one small step away from questioning them too. By the time of the Ninth Congress, all I could do was laugh at how absurd they were. In the film, the leftists are seated on the left, and they get a lot of time on camera. The rightists are on the right, they're the old party officials, and the camera pans over them quickly. The film shows something very rare. You actually hear Mao speaking in his own voice. The repeated assertions of unity and victory masked deep divisions among what were merely temporary allies. The only unchallengeable figure, the only fixed point, was Mao. Within two and a half years, the firmly enshrined successor Lin Biao would fall, both figuratively and literally. Accused of plotting to assassinate Mao, Lin Biao died in a mysterious plane crash. The only certainty was that the charred bodies were those of Lin, his wife, and his son. Lin Biao was the one who attacked my father most viciously. And then, suddenly Lin Biao was no longer Chairman Mao's successor. Now they said he'd been plotting to assassinate the chairman. This had a profound impact on the way people saw the Cultural Revolution. So we wrote to Chairman Mao, we want to see our parents. I said I can't see them. Being in a place like this, how can I face my children? Everyone knows that Chin Chong is a prison, a place for locking up bad people. And that's where I am. I can't see them. He said, it is Chairman Mao's directive that you see them. How can you say it's his directive, I asked. And he took out a note written by the chairman. The father's dead, but they can see the mother. We were astounded when we read this. Seeing the note, I asked, Shao Qi's dead? Can this be true? He said, yes, he's dead. But the children can see you. This is the chairman's order. But he wouldn't tell me what happened. He said, that's none of your business. We later learned that my father had died from pneumonia in the city of Kaifeng. When they carried his body out, he didn't even have any clothes on. They kept him alive until the Ninth Party Congress, so he could be denounced as a living example of a traitor. After that, it didn't matter. He fell ill and was left to die. Liu Shaoqi died on November 12, 1969. Institutional extremism was filling every corner of society. New and heinous plots were constantly being uncovered and thwarted. Prisons and labor camps filled up, and new ones were built. A combination of state power and what was dubbed the dictatorship of the masses dealt ruthlessly with the ever-changing face of counter-revolution. Everyone involved with our paper was interrogated. We were pressured to say things that would incriminate my brother or each other. But no one gave in. We admired the gadfly. It was my brother who introduced me to the book. We used the gadfly's example to encourage each other. He wrote to his girlfriend before his execution. Then am I a happy fly, if I live or if I die. I wrote a poem to my own girlfriend, using these lines. We were inspired by his calm defiance even when facing death. 
I think everything we did was worthy of his example. The police came to our house with a notification from my father. Sign this, they said. Your son's been shot. My father was so devastated, he crumpled on the spot and wailed. What's all this crying for? You're supposed to draw a clear line between yourself and your son. That's the way they talked. The revolution was devouring old revolutionaries like Liu Shaoqi, as well as the children of fallen capitalists like Yu Lo Ke. Individuals, regardless of their background or history, could all be sacrificed in its name. As China descended into darkness, the world presented on stage was ever more luminous. It was a sanitized realm in which enemies were constantly vanquished, heroic struggles forever victorious, and martyrs for the cause celebrated with shrill calls for ongoing revolution. the one-dimensional heroes of a few model works had lost any power to inspire. The cycles of revolution left the population exhausted. Pent-up frustrations would take several years to find an outlet. Zhou Enlai, for decades Premier of China, died in January 1976. He was regarded as a bastion of moderation compared to the extremists who had risen to power in the chaos. My awakening came late. It was not until the April 5th Tiananmen incident that I finally became disillusioned with Mao. April 5th was the traditional Chinese Day of Remembrance, but in 1976, it would herald the passing of an era. Crowds spontaneously gathered in Tiananmen Square to lay wreaths and recite poems in Zhou Enlai's memory. They came to honor the dead, but the outpouring of grief was a protest against the living. The people weep while jackals laugh, one poem read. Squads of the workers' militia were sent in with clubs. I had believed in the Communist Party because it was for the people. Now it was beating the people up. It wasn't the party I thought it was. I felt very sad. I started to have doubts about Mao. Then I thought, if Mao was wrong, my father might be right. But I didn't know where my father was, whether he was dead or alive. The April 5th Tiananmen incident was devastating. By 1976, we already felt alienated from the Cultural Revolution. The Cultural Revolution had pushed the revolutionary culture of socialist China to ever greater extremes. At the same time, it exposed its dark side. In this context, one thing Marx said about revolution could be reversed. That is, long live the revolution. The revolution is dead. Whoever tries to immortalize revolution will be the one who kills revolution. That's exactly what Mao did. Mao himself wouldn't die until September that year, but the protests in Tiananmen signaled his passing as surely as if he had already drawn his last breath. Within weeks of Mao's death, the so-called Gang of Four, Mao's wife and her radical associates, were arrested and eventually tried. The reign of revolutionary fundamentalism had come to an end. Now the Gang of Four was blamed for everything just as Peng Dehuai, Liu Shaoqi, and Lin Biao had been before them. Although there was talk of a gang of five, public debate about Mao would be stifled time and again. 
obstacles to the rehabilitation of those who'd been jailed, exiled, or killed over the decades took years to overcome. After a two-year search, Li Nanyang finally located her father in a remote village in southern China. She hadn't seen him in 11 years. My father waited for me to call him dad. I hadn't used that word for so many years. It took me a long time to get it out. I knew that as soon as I called him dad, the clear line that I had drawn between myself and an enemy of the party would vanish. He would simply be my father. I finally came out with it, and he cried. Those were the happiest days of my life. Finally, I was free to speak my mind, unlike 1967. She was too young then, and it was at the height of the Cultural Revolution. After we talked, I said to my father, You have been wronged. You are a good person, and I'll try to clear your name. Around 1979, many so-called bourgeois and revisionist films were shown again. The Gadfly was among them. Seeing it this time, I was struck by something that I hadn't really noticed before. It was the prison cell conversation between the Gadfly and his father. Arthur lashed out at Montanelli. It was a denunciation mixed with a lingering love, a hope that he might change. But he realized this was impossible. The scene made me think about the revolutionary culture that I had internalized when I was younger, what had attracted me, and what I had come to reject. The attraction was a sense of moral justice. And as I reflected on the lies and deceptions we'd experienced, just like Arthur, I thought about my cardinal, my relationship with the culture of the Communist Party. It felt very much like Arthur's farewell to Montanelli. Now I too would see my own cardinal, my red cloak clergy, recede into the distance. On January 1, 1979, I received a telegram, returning to Beijing on January 4. I jumped up from my bed. My father's case was resolved. The sun has finally risen for me. For several months afterwards, I was in a daze. I'd been called a bastard for 20 years, and suddenly I am a revolutionary, accepted by everyone, and people acted as though it had always been that way. The new evaluation I received at work now read like the eulogy for a revolutionary martyr. For years I'd thought I was good enough to be a Communist Party member, but they never let me join. Now, overnight, everything had changed, not because of anything I'd ever done, but because my father's name had been cleared. At that moment, the revolutionary ideals that had always sustained me suddenly collapsed. Everything was a lie. Nothing was true. From the moment my father was rehabilitated, I wanted nothing more to do with the party, nothing more to do with the revolution. For many, the revolution is dead. Utopian promise now appears in different guises. But the specter of Mao is never far away. When people feel oppressed and powerless, when a system permits no legitimate protest or dissent, Mao emerges as a possibility, a champion of the right to rebel. <laughs> 